Well, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, organizing this um, wonderful uh, symposium, and I have learned a lot. This is very eye-opening to me. And um, as Jing said, I'm a neuroscientist, and I study the neural basis of uh, behavior, uh, animal, and maybe even human behavior. And I also have a particular interest in how the uh, nervous system uh, develop to form uh, the biological neural network uh, that analyzes the, the behavior. Now, um, the, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, I would say, on the, uh, in its infant phase right, in this field, uh, compared to uh, some other works that uh, uh, the speakers have talked about. This is actually um, relatively uh, um, early stage. I guess everything is early stage, but this one is particular. I want to start off by saying that uh, the, the analyzing behavior uh, goes beyond, uh, to, uh, beyond medicine. Right? It is important for many branches of uh, the society and, uh, and the science. And uh, uh, for I, on the left of four panels, I showed the, uh, some examples that uh, we are collaborating with, um, you know, different investigators with, and, and uh, obviously, uh, analyzing animal behavior is very important for neuroscience and also human behavior. It's very important for neuroscience, which uh, focuses on, on, you know, uh, uh, on uh, understanding the um, biological basis of uh, behavior. Uh, the, uh, it's also important for uh, evolution. And I'm showing here a, a monkey, a, a, a Japanese a macaque, that's handling rock, rocks. And in that field, if there's this particular investigator in France is studying the how, um, how the cognitive ability evolve. And uh, uh, in that field, the artificial intelligence hasn't really been used to analyze the, the behavior of primates, for example. And often these, uh, these studies are carried out in the field. Uh, so looking at the wide uh, you know, primates. And, and, uh, um, uh, it's also important for em uh, environmental science. And shown here is a, a, a research group in Utah reached out, that reached out to us um, more recently. And they are interested in studying uh, cattle behavior. And especially, they, are, they got a funding to uh, study how uh, large carnivores or, um, or humans, the presence of you know, the, uh, humans or, or carnivores on uh, cattle behavior. So they have thousands of um, images uh, to, to analyze, and artificial intelligence is really needed. They are currently having, a graduate, stu having graduate students to, to label uh, the data to identify. Um, that was, but now with the artificial intelligence, it's much um, uh, faster. We also were reached out by a group who is interested, uh, that is interested in studying shark behavior. And uh, they are interested in knowing how human factor, human, uh, uh, humans and the environmental factors affect the um, influence the shark behavior. And I can imagine there's many other uses of uh, behavior analysis in artificial in, uh, intelligence based behavior analysis in the society. Um, I'm going to skip. So now, uh, uh, the behavior analysis uh, in medicine is not new. Because many, many uh, medical conditions, uh, the diagnosis or treatment of many uh, medical conditions involve analyzing behavior. Well, this may not be you know, automatic, but the doctors actually would actually evaluate the, the behavior of the, of the patients. This could involve neurodevelopmental disorders like autism spectrum disorders or the neurodegenerative resource disorders or other uh, medical conditions that don't involve a uh, nervous system uh, as long as they have uh, behavioral uh, changes. And I want to, uh, I, here I use autism spectrum disorder as an example. And this uh, cartoon may not be the, uh, the professional um, um, you know, description of all the behaviors. I do have a list that the CDC actually um, put on their website uh, on the signs and the symptoms of um, autism spectrum disorders, and it's a long list of the behavior changes. Many of them actually can be, can be analyzed and quantified. Uh, so now, there, there are behavior types that, uh, that can be actually um, 
identified and quantified in autism spectrum disorders. I, I pick this particular one as a, just the, for the sake of, uh, of expanding it, the uh, tiptoe work, uh, tiptoeing. So uh, there is a study reporting that uh, the um, autistic um, uh, kids have a higher uh, chance to, to actually tiptoe. Now this is a probability. This isn't that guaranteed, right? Obviously, it's a, a many factors involved. So you can imagine that uh, the diagnosis of this of uh, autism is very tricky because there's uh, so many factors that are involved, and uh, they're not you know there's there ne not necessarily one actually behavior change defines autism. <laughs> so so this is a multi-dimensional problem. And uh, um, uh, I want to highlight uh, this MIT uh, uh, study that actually uh, uh, tried to tackle, uh, tackle this problem. So they had, a, they had a humanoid robots that connected the behavior data from, the, um, from the, um, this kit uh, drawn here. Um, and uh, they also connected the physiological data, like a heartbeat, a body temperature, those. So then they use the deep, they use deep learning to, um, to gauge, to assess you know, the, the types of autism or, the, or the, uh, the severity of the condition. And as, uh, as I, I just said, actually, if you ask, uh, you, know, you get uh, the pediatric uh, um, you know, neurologist to evaluate the, you know, each individual cases, they may have different opinion. So they got uh, five uh, human experts and they had a different opinion, but they use a mathematical consensus to label the data, and then uh, try to uh, get the uh, you know, uh, as automatic assessment of the condition. There's many benefit of doing this. This is still very early stage. There's an important uh, need of uh, behavior analysis in preclinical studies uh, done in animal models. So here are several examples that our collaborators are. Are, um, are doing. So, uh, for example, the Brandon Watson lab, you know, uh, uses uh, these wheels uh, that, you know, this is a mouse running on a, a wheel. And um, uh, Jeff Murphy lab uh, uses uh, this particular assay to, enter, to, to find out if, uh, you know, a mouse is curious about uh, other mice. Because in those two K boxes, there's one, uh, you know, uh, there's other mice in it. And there might be an older one or a new one, or, or you know, the one that the this behaving mouse is uh, familiar uh, familiar with, or the new one. So there, uh, on the um, upper right, uh, upper right is uh, uh, Carrie Ferrar uh, Ferrario's data uh, on drug addiction. This is rat after I have uh, is injected with a um, drug of abuse. Uh, down here is a, a rat uh, with a. Uh, implanted with the uh, um, five optics to so stimulate the neurons. Now, challenges for behavior analysis, uh, and, and I, I, I put together, uh, put the, um, combined the uh, clinical and the preclinical pre -clinical studies uh, here together. So there is a difference between natural you know, behavior and design tests. Now, let's say you know, parents bring a cat to the doc, pediatric neurologist, and uh, they, they suspect that there's something different in the kid, and it might be autism. And so the, the doctor have a one-hour appointment, and within the one hour, the doctor needs to kind of you know, get some ideas and decide what to do with it. So, so the kid behavior obviously can be different with a person observing it, a doctor, a stranger observing him, her, or uh, in, or, uh, from the natural environment. This is true for animal as well. Now, although we can design tests for animal behavior, for example, we can test when, whether an animal can remember things, a spatial memory in a forced swimming test. Uh, but the, but the animal actually can have the different uh, neural bases for memory when they are in their home cage, when they're in their natural environment. By just uh, focusing on, for example, water maze, we're losing a lot of, uh, you know, the, uh, um, other aspects of the of the neuroscience, right? For example, so there's a need uh, to actually observe the animal in their native environment. Right? And the, the, the now, 
the kid, you know, the parents bring the kid, brought the kid to the doctor. The doctor actually say, you know, what do you think is wrong with the kid? Or what, what is happening? And the, kid, uh, the parents are not experts of, of you know, the, of autism. So, so they just notice that there's something different. And uh, they might say that they might be tiptoeing. Um, but we all, we all tiptoe. So, so then the, you know, the question is that how frequent, how often? Then you need to quantify that data. And uh, these are not easily done in, the, in this, you know, currently, right? But just by, um, by human, or let's say, manual uh, analysis of the behavior. Right? So you can imagine an automatic process that analyzes video recordings would really benefit this field. And you know, the, it might actually also set a standard, I mean, uh, allow the, you to evaluate based on the consensus, or at least the mathematical consensus among the experts in the field. So, so my point is that the tools for autom automatic behavior analysis are needed. And the AI-based tools are advantageous because they can um, be trained to assess like expert among uh, many other advantages. Uh, uh, advantages. Now the types of AI-based automatic uh, behavior tools currently available uh, are, um, I, I uh, summarize them into two types, right? You know, one is the based on the unsupervised approach. The other is the supervised approach by mimicking the, the human perception of the behavior. So uh, I, I also like to see, uh, to, to, uh, to, to mention that this actually is, a, these two approaches reflect the, uh, whether you start with, uh, with identifying behavioral type and then quantify behavior or you actually do the uh, opposite directions. And so, um, uh, now, the, 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 in the first approach, in the unsupervised approach, you would uh, f uh, get the, the you measure, do the measurements of the anim animal, uh, uh, behaving Anymore, and uh, then uh, use a mathematical approach, the computational approach, uh, to actually uh, to di discover the, the behavior types. So uh, this deep lab cut is a software that currently widely used for tracking animal um, uh, movements, motions. So basically, uh, this is a deep learning based tool. Basically, the users would define the, the key points in, in, the, in the body, uh, and then the software does a great job uh, tracking. Uh, the, the XY position of each of these dots. So it occupies this, uh, this spreadsheet with X, Y uh, you know, uh, uh, positions, right, uh, position. The larger data set over time, you, know, you will get a larger data set over time you know, uh, in the, in the, um, from the video. Now, now this, this tool doesn't itself tell you which behavior the animal is performing. You need uh, other tools to interpret the data. Right? So how do you do that? And this is um, typically done uh, uh, with the unsupervised approach, right? So, so wh what I just showed you, showed you was a more you know, high dimensional data, right? There's each dot, dot is, is one dimension, so there's more dimension, many dimensions in that. Yeah. So you basically reduce the dimension uh, using computational approaches. And then you, you, know, you see these clusters of, of this uh, data that would uh, indicate, uh, may indicate different behaviors. Right, this isn't, isn't a guarantee. And uh, how many clusters uh, there should be is defined by you. You are guess that uh, there might be this number of behavior you know, to avoid, uh, for example, uh, overfitting. There's other software, for example, MOSAC actually does um, uh, another uh, type of unsupervised approach. But mathematical clusters often don't uh, have the corresponding behaviors. And uh, we tested some of these approaches and we had uh, uh, some uh, challenges, difficulties. But, uh, but uh, you know, th there is a definite advantage in these uh, unsupervised approaches because uh, you know, not uh, all the behaviors can be picked up by a human observer. There might be actually uh, you know, the subtlety or the you know, things that uh, the, the, you know, the machine can, can uh, recognize, but the uh, humans cannot. So uh, the other uh, type of uh, class of uh, tools uh, uh, currently, actually, um, just uh, started to come out uh, in more recent years are uh, these deep learning based behavior classification tools. So they use the deep neural networks and uh, then you feed uh, the neural network, train the neural networks with the behavior examples that you label. For example, you just uh, give the video to the, 
to the uh, to, to the computer and uh, tell it uh, this mouse is licking or is scratching, and then you label the data and then the software does does it. Uh, but but the current tools, uh, I mean, the, 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 this particular tool is a representative of this. This uh, it, this type of tools often don't uh, quantify the data, because uh, quantify the 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 behavior, animals' movements, because they don't track the data. You know, so it's a, a computationally demanding, resource demanding, because uh, every pixel actually is analyzed. Now, in the field of behavior analysis. The social behavior is particularly difficult to analyze because there's, there's multiple levels of multiple you know, uh, difficulties in, in this. Uh, for example, you need to tra tra uh, you track multiple animals, and oftentimes these animals will actually, you know, they, they, they physically actually merge with each other. And uh, you would uh, need to recognize them so that uh, there is an ID switch so that you know, the, you, know the, you can recognize them well. Uh, you also uh, would like to deter determine each, each individual's role. For example, if there is, uh, uh, say, aggression happening, who is the, you know, who is the aggressor, who is, you know, who is receiving it? You know, this kind of relationship. And uh, uh, certainly, oftentimes, you know, we are interested in interactions across the species or uh, between uh, animal and uh, between animals and uh, uh, the environment, right? Uh, the objects in the environment. So, so these these actually are, are complex problems. And so, what's the status? Uh, uh, you know, state, uh, current status. Now, uh, I, these these two are examples. Right? One is called Mars. Uh, this developer, the 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 um, the developers. Uh, Reduce the difficulty of the tracking problem by using uh, mice, mice of two different body colors, the coat colors, right, a white and a black, and and then they could uh, um, they could track them, and they, they use a, a key point of tracking, right? uh, key point of tracking. You see that the aggression attacks or those, but it only works for mice, and uh, it doesn't distinguish individuals' role because you know the way you label these data would be you know in this. Frame time frame. There uh, in this, uh, you know, the uh, period uh, there was an aggression attack that occurred. Who is attacking what? Uh, isn't it necessarily easy? And it only works for two mice. And, and uh, the, the the current uh, there is a preprint just posted uh, as um, uh, from a Harvard group that they use the so-called key point mosaic. They again they use a deep left cats output, so for ch you know tracking the the animal with key points. And then again, these only analyze simple social behavior between two mice. You see that in the social behavior analysis, the number two, number two is is uh, is a magic number because <laughs> that's the that's the way all you can do. So uh, there there needs obviously there needs a better tools for, for this. So in my in my view that uh, the, uh, there is this triangle of um, you know in the uh, the. Uh, AI-based uh, uh, behavior analysis: so the accuracy, efficiency, and accessibility. But accuracy, efficiency are obvious, and they can actually uh, help each other. And, and what about accessibility? The key is that I think that uh, you need to know your users when you develop tools like this. The users of of, of a behavior analysis are usually not good at the AI or, or CS. I'm speaking from my per, you know, first person experience, right? So these are biologists and the neuroscientists. The newer generations are actually are better at coding or uh, AI. But uh, currently, the workforce in this area are not good at this area. They are learning about this, uh, and, uh, about AI and coding. So they, would, they want to have a tool that uh, doesn't require uh, coding or match coding. And they they can actually then say um, uh, you know uh, easily use it to uh, and adapt it to their specific studies. Now, in a, in a, for example, in a behavior study or neuroscience study, you often actually say notice that there is a, maybe a new behavior or maybe a new new uh, new thing that you want to quantify. And if this involves much uh, you know coding or it's a commercial software, you need to. Get the you know uh, pay for the company to adding that aspect for you just to test your hypothesis or your hunch. 
that's not going to work. They're not going to do it. But the experimental mentor are going to uh, may, may just drop the idea. Right? So it will be much better if they actually, in this workflow, they actually have this convenient tools that they can define their behavior, the user defined behavior aspect, and they do quantification. And they find, oh, after all, there wasn't a drug effect on this aspect. Or, or there was an interesting thing in this. Right? So, and uh, you know, the, uh, the many of the users are, are restricted by uh, resources available. I mean, we are fortunate here, we have uh, high-performing you know, computing resources. But many people don't. And uh, for example, those people studying monkey behavior, they, they commented in their paper that they you know, uh, use the AI to analyze behavior. They commented that uh, the, uh, many of those primate uh, research in the field are in the, uh, say, poor countries, for example, in Africa. So they don't have the internet speed or the access, you know, at least in a short period to, act, to actually analyze the data or, or the visitors that are there. So they need to be, have efficient uh, softwares. Now, but on the positive side, the, these users have deep understanding of biology and medicine. And uh, they, they can form a community and share data and improve the, uh, the tools. And uh, there might be actually opportunities to use personal uh, devices like uh, cell phones for parents, for example, to shoot uh, the videos of their kids. And uh, then provide that to the doctor. And uh, there are the opportunities for citizen science. So the uh, accessibility is important. Um, now, those are the motivations why we developed uh, this tool. We call it LabGene for efficient automatic uh, quantification of behavior across the species. And uh, so we, we published uh, the first uh, 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 version of this tool earlier, but uh, in the past the six months, we already actually made a major uh, improvement of, of this. And uh, this field is moving very fast. In the, every month, you will see a paper publishing an uh, AI-based tool for analyzing behavior. Uh, you know, often specialized with some, tool, uh, some particular problems, but moving very fast. So uh, uh, no, what the lab gym can do, the first thing it can do is it can track animals and objects in the natural environment, in the newer version. I'm showing you the, the, the chip and the monk, because, because this is a chip monk, that, this is one chip monk that the, uh, the ref research investigator in my lab shoot, and uh, we often use this one, this, this chip monk to, to demonstrate our, our, our tool. So, this, this chipmunk is going to move in, enter the room, and you'll see that because the background actually changes. You see the illuminations over the light, you know, the lighting, and the, you know, the changes, but the, the, that, that poses the, uh, you know, challenging problem of tracking the animal you know, in that background, right? So the, the, the software does a pretty good job, actually. You see that it's tracked quite well. Uh, you know, that's a, right now it's in a very bright background. It comes in, in the dark, and you know, the, the software can track it. Now, uh, and on the right hand is uh, two animals. The, these, this is sp particular species are mo monogamists. Uh, you know, they the male female bonding, and uh, they, they you see that they uh, they look alike. It's difficult to to actually distinguish it, uh, unlike the you know white and black uh, coat colors, and uh, the software tracks it pretty well. Now, the the field has been well. This is a relatively new field. AI-based behavior analysis. The field has been, uh, you know, people have been um, trying to develop tools to track the, the animals in the, for such kind of problem. Uh, but uh, they, they are, they're really uh, uh, good tools, reliable tools. They often specialize for a particular scenario, a particular type of animal. But how, how did we achieve this this quickly? It's, it's because of the, some of the newest deep learning tools available like the uh, mask RCNN uh, neural network. And then uh, Meta AI, the, the Facebook actually did a, uh, use, you know, use a large data set to train this neural network and we just grab it and then to use it for the animal tracking. It does a great job. Now, the lab team can analyze uh, simple behavior, uh, certainly, but uh, I, I want to show here is a, is a complex behavior, social behavior. On the left side is our uh, five uh, fruit flies, uh, Drosophila melanogaster. We typically use it to study the for example, genes and uh, their behavior. And, and uh, uh, the, we, we're going to track, we, we'll track these individual flies and uh, then find out uh, what each fly is doing in this, in this, scenario, in, in this arena. And uh, 
this is a complex problem because at any moment, each fly can have potential interactions with all the other four. And so it's a, it's a you know very it's a complex problem you know you, you may this may bring you know your memory about uh, um, uh, graph theories but uh, sorry um, but um, you see that the software the current does a great job of doing that this is actually we are seeing that a male fly chasing a female and they're singing a courtship songs uh, they they extend their wings to, to sing a song and identify that uh, now on the we we can identify not only um, you know, multiple animals, uh, but also telling uh, what each one is doing. On the right side of the, this movie, that chip of the monk is getting a, a peanut from a human hand. And you see that we actually can see for each uh, uh, you know, partner involved in this, in a party involved in this process, actually you can, I, we identified the behavior types in, in it. So uh, this is also, um, uh, complex uh, social behavior, actually. So then you can know um, what each part. No, what makes the, the leptin uh, this efficient and, and uh, accurate? Uh, I'm not going to talk about how we analyze the social behavior. This is uh, more complex to explain. I'm, I'm going to actually look at it, uh, explain the simpler behavior, how we actually, but uh, the, the, I, there is an idea uh, that actually was used in a more extensive way in the analyze social behavior. Uh, one of the key is this, uh, this pattern image idea. So the, the, time, uh, the, the, the behavior uh, data are time varying data, like language. So if I, if I sh ask you, uh, you know, human observer, to, to tell me what this, you know, this is a Drosophila lava, what this lava is doing, and it will say, no, play the video first. Right? I, otherwise, how do I know that what the uh, uh, lava is doing? So I play the video, you see that the actual lava is rolling its body. You see that it took you a few seconds to watch the movie, and then you even use your short-term memory to actually you know, assess this, the, what behavior this animal did. The deep neural network does exactly the same. You know, we need to actually have this short-term memory, and then analyze it connects these frames over time. right? So, so the accuracy is, is not great. If we directly use this to analyze and then make a decision whether, you know, categorize, classify the behavior is not great. We tested it. It's not great. Now, so, so instead, we actually, we thought that we could actually collapse the time axis uh, and so that we can, you can, we can um, uh, transform this time varying data to a two-dimensional image. Right. This is a simple, uh, intuitive way to, to, uh, to, um, to um, reduce the time dimension. And so, so then, from this, what we call pattern image, you can tell, actually, immediately, what the lava is doing, for example, at least for the most part. And then we have different neural networks specialized for analyzing the time series varying data or the uh, two-dimensional images, and then you categorize the behavior. Uh, here, I'm not going to go into the detail, but basically we did uh, this ablation experiment to remove one of these uh, you know, uh, analysis, and uh, then we, we found that actually, really, you need, uh, you need a both to, to make this uh, very efficient. And if you have to choose only one, then choose a pattern image. It does a pretty good job in the accuracy already. Right? So here is a different time you know, that we can. Uh, we did a benchmark comparison with state of the art and uh, um, shows that it's very useful, very efficient. Now, there's a pipeline. As I said, the accessibility or usability right, to the you know, user experience is very important for, for this type of tools. So these, uh, first, the, the lab gym can create a uh, standalone visualizable uh, examples. Well, this is a very, uh, this is a, the uh, uh, important, uh, I think, uh, uh, aspect that's missing in the field of behavior analysis. We don't have a big data set or a community data set for, you know, with all different species of the animals doing different behavior. So if, if we had that, you know, data set, we would uh, probably reproducibility or the, 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 the uh, uh, workflow efficiency would be much better. So there needs tools to develop that. So, I, uh, so the lab team can do that. 
And then after you get the, the, the you know, behavior categorization, then it, has, you know, it analyzes the, all these quantifi you know, uh, quantifiable uh, parameters and then perform automatic uh, statistical analysis. And this is important too because for each behavior, we might have maybe 13 you know, uh, parameters, parameters that we measure. And then you will have experimental groups, control multiple experimental groups, and then there's a lot of pairwise comparisons. So we do this automatic comparisons, and then the, the software will tell you the, uh, you know, which, which aspect of the behavior is different between the control and the treatment, for example. So uh, this is a real uh, uh, data uh, on drug addiction, and uh, the, 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 the rat is treated, uh, injected with amphetamine or with just a saline, and then uh, they are treated uh, multiple times, and you can see this uh, on this rest blot that you can see actually the drug obviously have an effect, and so we uh, this also uh, can quantify st uh, and uh, perform statistical analysis. So the, uh, the, uh, Yu Jiahu uh, is um, a key player in developing lab gene, and uh, uh, we also have other Isabel and Kelly are important contributors. All right, I take any questions. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm curious if your you or your team has um, possibly incorporated audio at all into detecting behavior. Right. We haven't, and that would be very uh, very useful for for uh, yeah both preclinical techniques. Yeah, like so. I know you showed a lot of examples of like say like maybe like uh, insects or like <laughs> some other animals that maybe don't you know voice what their behavior yeah. is. But for example, with mammals, like they can be doing like a distress call or like a mating yeah. call, and that would like possibly increase the prediction of your uh, yes. behavior algorithms. And also, I th um, I'm wondering if you've ever um, sort of looked at multiple behaviors happening simultaneously. So for example, I think in one of your previous slides, you showed insects that were like both like crawling and yeah, curling. Yeah. Like it seemed like they were doing both behaviors at once. Like have you considered like that as a possible label class um, in some of your algorithms? Right, right. So, 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 Labeling data itself is uh, actually a discovery process. So when we try to label the data, we, we, we see scenarios like that. There is this behavior we didn't notice, but how do we label this? And then we, that actually, uh, you know, sometimes we label it as a new group, like new behavior types. Sometimes we, we think about if it, it happens too rare, we, we uh, you know, exclude it. But, but sometimes we would uh, actually maybe you know, um, consider that uh, we only label one aspect of it, right? One, one aspect of behavior. But, but uh, yes, the labeling data actually requ requires a, a good understanding about the, the behavior. And it's oftentimes it's, uh, inspirational to the uh, labeler, to the person who actually labels the data. Uh, there, is, there is this interactive process, right, you know, between the machine and, and uh, the experimenter. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I had a question regarding um, one of the symptoms you mentioned um, in the first slide. Yeah. Um, so there was, um, you discussed the, um, you know, the lack of a sense of danger. Um, for example, like um, a child on the autism spectrum running right. out into traffic. Right. And I think that that's a very important and unfortunately tragic discussion, you know, that needs to, you know, happen. Um, and I was wondering how much of your research is devoted um, to this specific issue. Um, and this kind of relates to me personally because I um, had a family friend um, whose son um, was a teenager and um, he, um, um, he and his mom both died in a house fire because he did not have the ability to recognize, um, you know, that he needed to flee the house and his mom wasn't able to carry him outside. So um, that's kind of like one of those, you know, uh, you know, not being able to sense danger. Um, and 
And obviously, you know, um, this stuff, like, isn't, like, I mean, this still happens. Like, it, it, this isn't just, like, an individual case. And I was wondering, like, how artificial intelligence can be used to prevent, like, horrific tragedies like this um, from happening in the future. Um, well, I, I think uh, this is, uh, is an important question. And uh, this field is very um, it's, uh, infant, uh, you know, infantile uh, phase. And, and uh, I, I think it, uh, it itself actually, I mean, that's a long list of CDC, you know, uh, um, symptom, I mean, listed uh, symptoms. Actually, each of them probably uh, deserves some, you know, uh, studies about how do you, how you could actually quantify these, recognize these, quantify this in a, you know, uh, in a, from a video, right, or from a, um, a behavior uh, observation. So, I, I haven't, we, we haven't, uh, we certainly haven't, uh, um, you know, looked into this, but, uh, um, you know, that there's a lot of studies that needs to be done to actually make this happen. But I think that even starting from some of them, maybe three symptoms will help doctors. At least they will have an informed, you know, or maybe, you know, not just their hunch, but actually the data backed, you know, uh, uh, assessment. Yeah, um, that makes sense, especially um, since autism is a very broad spectrum and, um, you know, um, um, sorry, I'm trying to think. Um, like obviously my family friend's son was far more profound um, in his symptoms um, and um, you know like I just think um, sorry I'm stuttering but um, I, I definitely um, th agree with you that every symptom you know can um, be quantified. Um, and there's like so much research to do in this area since it's, um, you know, since there, since all of this research is relatively new. Um, so thank you for doing that. Thank you. All right. Oh, do you have a question? I'm just curious about the, the standardization. So is there is there any standard for exchanging uh, either the images, the videos themselves, or the after you've classified and said these are the behaviors at particular time, or, or is it really single use data for the particular labs? I'm not aware actually. I'm not aware of the standardization. The, the, the data set that uh, basically it's all in different labs. <laughs> they are, you know, every lab to generate their own data and then train. Uh, part of it is because of the software or, or not, you know. Um, it's still de being developed. It's uh, it's new. Uh, they they are they are co they are community effort on uh, uh, deep lab cut, you know, for tracking, right? So there's more more effort on that. There's a community about that. But uh, identifying behavior types or these uh, like the uh, you know um, you know second class of of the behavior uh, analysis tools actually would really benefit from data sets that are. Uh, um, that does you know standardized or the you know processed. So, I, yeah, I mean the, there isn't a, enough <laughs> of, of that. And it, whether or no later, how do you actually know it's the reliable? You know, the, I think the, the, this uh, again involves the community's uh, effort, and uh, this is also lacking. The the model one chance may be actually you know be discreted by another in person. So it's important that we we basically. Uh, publicize basically, uh, you know, have make these data sets open source, right? So that everybody can have access to read the data. Say that I disagree with you on calling this, uh, you know, uh, say uh, lava rolling, for example. And uh, th that's fine. And uh, you can either change your own data or uh, your own model, or you can say several experts in the field can come together, say have a discussion, say why I don't think it is, or they can reach, uh, you know. Um, Consensus, uh, or maybe it's a mathematical consensus like that MIT group did uh, among uh, five uh, neurologists. They used the interclass uh, corre correlation to kind of get a mathematical consensus and uh, to label the data. So, so those approaches are lacking in, in the field. 